morning. Thank you so much for coming. It's a delight and honor and privilege um, uh, uh, to have you here on behalf of the Creed program. A special thank you for those that have come from Iraq and Nigeria and Myanmar and Pakistan and those that have traveled from the United States and, um, and Europe and everyone who's come across from the UK. Um, we would uh, like to, the purpose of the, the meeting today is to share with you our emerging program. The program is called the Coalition uh, for Religious Equality and Inclusive Development, CREED. It's, the coalition is taking forward a four-year program that seeks to integrate poverty reduction in development. And um, it, it is, as the name suggests, uh, a coalition or consortium. So perhaps I would, um, we start by saying who comprises this consortium. Um, we will go by alphabetical order. We have the Hoi Foundation, which is uh, one of the largest Shia Muslim organizations in the world. It provides educational services, uh, engages in interfaith and uh, intercultural dialogue and advocacy, in addition to dissemination of religious knowledge and services through its Islamic centers. It has an office here in London, and we're very delighted um, that we have uh, a, a, a team from El Hoi right there. Um, <laughs> um, and, um, Please uh, uh, feel free to say hello to them in the breaks. And of course, they will be leading one of our panels uh, later on in the day. We have CSW, um, which is a human rights organization specializing in freedom of religion or belief. And it works around gathering evidence and documenting um, human rights abuse, in particular with respect to freedom of religion or belief. Um, engages in training and equipping activists, journalists, religious leaders, and NGOs and policymakers in how um, to champion for or to support their existing efforts to champion for. Um, the Institute of Development Studies um, is a global research and learning organization that is part of the University of Sussex. Um, and IDS is committed to advancing equitable and sustainable development and change. It has a number of master's programs and uh, PhD research programs, um, as well as various forms of professional support and works very closely with 320 partners around the world. Partners that comprise governments, civil society organizations, um, international NGOs, citizens, um, researchers, businesses um, and others. A minority rights group, um, international campaigns worldwide, uh, also working in partnership, uh, around 130 partners in over 60 countries, specifically looking at ways of supporting the voices of the religious, uh, religious minorities and indigenous people um, to make sure that their voices are heard. It uh, engages through training, uh, education, legal cases, publications, media work, cultural programs, and um, minority rights group. Minority rights group, yay! Uh, will be leading uh, one of the panels on uh, the relationship between hate speech, online and offline mobilization of hate. Um, so, uh, our program has two elements that are very interconnected. There is a research element, but there is also uh, a delivering, delivery of practical development programs on the ground element, and they both go very much hand in hand. Um, and we, we are committed to uh, bringing those two elements, development and research, together for the purpose of engaging with issues of freedom of religion or belief, those that have no belief or those that are not part of a particular religious faith, um, and issues of religious inequalities, different inequalities across groups, and um, into the arena of uh, how development and humanitarian aid uh, is thought about and engaged with. Um, somebody asked, why this program now? Um, why you talk about freedom of religion being in development at this particular point in time? And we've been thinking a lot about this, and I think the question needs to be flipped. How is it that it's only now that this program started? And let's just think for a minute. 
in the 21st century and in these past months what's, what's, what's been happening. 21st century, we've had two genocides already, a genocide in Myanmar and a genocide in Iraq. Just over the last six to nine months, we have had uh, attacks on synagogues in the US, we have had over 50 people die in New Zealand, and we have had over 50, 250 people die in Sri Lanka more recently. Um, in addition to these very strong acts of uh, violence, there's also experiences of everyday encroachment on people's ability to feel their dignity, their self-respect, um, because they happen to be otherized by the community because they're associated with a, a faith, independently of whether they practice the faith or not. So the question is, why has it taken us so long? I uh, just want to take a, a, a moment. Thank you, Mr. Fiegel. I know you've come from the G20 all the way from Japan. So thank you for, and of course we'll be, we'll be introducing the, the panel in a minute. Um, please take a seat. So the question is, why? Why is it that with all the inequalities, atrocious as genocides, or as in everyday practices, why has it taken us so long to ask ourselves why freedom of religious, uh, free, freedom of religion will be in development? Given that the arena of bringing in religion in development happened 20, 30 years ago, thanks to the work of Catherine Marshall and, and Mike Batcon and a variety of of, of people around the room here who have uh, been um, engaging with this issue. Um, and I know that um, uh, uh, Mike will engage with this from an institutional point of view, but just to share a few points, and don't try to be, this is a very badly written uh, PowerPoint, there's too much crammed in there, but these are just some, some points. Development and humanitarian uh, work has done great strides in recognizing inequalities across gender, across disability, across class, across uh, geographic location, north and south, um, across even issues of external and internal. Think of indigenous movements, indigenous groups in development, very well embedded, or at least progressing towards being well embedded. So why is it that when it comes to religious inequalities or freedom of religion or belief, there is this blind spot? Now, we know that blind spot doesn't necessarily exist in academia. There is work in academia exploring this question. But certainly in development programming and policy making, it is a blind spot to a large extent. Now, part of it, of course, has to do with the hangover from the colonialist era. There was a time when Western uh, countries did use religious diversity in colonized communities as a divide and rule, uh, divide and rule card. Uh, we know that it's a fact, we have the evidence. Um, that legacy has um, left a very uncomfortable feeling for those that want to have a new start, a new way of engaging, a redressing of old power relations. And they think when it comes to inequalities in society, it's, they, there are issues. The second is, for a very long time, issues to do with religious uh, freedoms have been seen as a foreign policy issue. This is the stuff that policy dialogue happens behind closed doors. And consequently, they haven't seen it as part of the development agenda that development practitioners, programmers, policy makers engage with. Compare this, for example, with child nutrition or women's empowerment. Uh, that is not seen as a foreign policy issue. Contrast this with freedom of religion or belief. But also, it is contextual. In many parts of the world where there are violations of religious freedoms for those that have faith or no faith. Um, these countries see these issues as a security portfolio. They see this as an issue that is the remit of the security agencies and they see this as a, a matter of national sovereignty and security. And these red lines have meant that for development programmers, humanitarians, um, they have concerns. If we step into this area, which is considered a red line, what will happen to the rest of our people? Um, find one of the, the other issues, of course, is the fact uh, that freedom of religion or belief for some, let's not generalize, but for some members of uh, social justice movements, um, for uh, those advocating human rights, for uh, those uh, engaged in what they, they 
itself described as progressive politics, they see this issue as one associated or one driven or one led by political forces that they are in conflict with. And so uh, there's a struggle of disentangling the actors from the agenda. And so they choose not, some of them, again, not to generalize, to not engage with the agenda altogether. So unfortunately, um, there has been this disconnect with advances in, in social, in, in justice, agendas not necessarily including freedom of religion or belief. But then there's also a very difficult question that has to do with um, uh, values. When we started this program and we were engaging with uh, different uh, critical allies, they said, oh, but, you know, I said, we're, we're going to be working on religious inequalities. We're going to be working on freedom of religion or belief. And they would say, but, uh, but we're not religious. As if one has to be religious to care for freedom of religion or belief. It's interesting because we have, we've, we've passed this when it comes to women's equality. You don't have to be a woman to care for equality. You recognize that for the sake of humanity, for the sake of humane societies, we all need to advance women's equality. The same thing for the rights of um, children and so forth. But when it comes to those who are marginalized on the basis of their faith, there is this sense of where do I stand vis-a-vis -vis the question of religion and spirituality. And, and it's interesting to see how this unfolds. Um, now, by no means are we generalizing, but we're tr these are a set of propositions, and some of them may be true to a certain extent, and some certainly not. And I think one of the purposes today is to perhaps interrogate uh, some of them based on the enormous expertise and experience um, that we have across the room. So, um, a little bit about our program um, and how we will uh, seek to, uh, as, 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 uh, as a consortium, um, engage with issues of developing social cohesion, and religious inequalities and so And just a, a footnote, uh, we mentioned uh, the whole E, CSW, Minority Rights Group, uh, but we also have no less than 20 partners in five countries who we work with. Um, the reason why I did not cite them is that uh, as a consortium, we uh, arrived at a conclusion that given the sensitivities in some of the countries in which we work, uh, we would rather um, wait and get the cue from our partners when they would like their names to be shared. Um, however, this will in no way undermine our ability to share the learning coming from these countries with you on a regular basis. It just means that there will be times in which uh, we will take our cue from our partners when they would like um, to have their names shared or not. Um, now, you will notice that today's program, the five sessions we have, happen to correspond to the five <coughs> areas of our program. So our program today is a consortium. We organized it around this. Um, the first session will be on mainstreaming awareness of freedom of religion or belief, um, uh, which IDS with the consortia are engaging with, with obviously our partners. Um, interfaith service delivery, we'll get to a minute, CSW is chairing that session and uh, we uh, and will um, help us think through. Minority Rights Group will be chairing and leading the session on our thinking on uh, monitoring hate speech, um, and the HOI will be uh, leading on helping, uh, 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 helping us interrogate and engage with issues of coalition building around social cohesion and advancement of rights. And then the cross fertilization for religious inclusivity is where uh, we, are, we are hoping that uh, there will be a space for all of us from the different backgrounds and expertise, faith, human rights, development, humanitarian, uh, foreign policy. Um, and of course, we know there's a, it's often academic, uh, more than one identity at the same time, that we will be able to um, um, engage together with this um, across the world. So, just very briefly, um, when we talk about mainstreaming freedom of religion or belief, in non belief in development, what are we going to engage with? Um, first of all, we want some evidence. We want to know 
when development practitioners are sensitive, like they are, for example, on gender equality, um, when they're sensitive to religious inclusivity, to the plurality of religions in a context in which they engage, what does it look like? What impact does it have? And when development is blind to engaging with these forms of inequality, what does it mean for the leave no one behind agenda? What does it mean for redressing exclusions? Um, we will also see how, how we can bring in the enormous expertise from the different fields that you all hold into uh, development planning and thinking. Um, because we are uh, particularly biased to uh, those that are marginalized, to the poor, we also will be hoping to produce an annual report that is using participatory methodologies with um, those that are living in poverty and suffering from religious exclusion to see what does it mean in terms of their everyday lives. What does it mean when you go to the market? What does it mean for your experiences at school and university? What does it mean for your experiences um, on the street and so forth? The second area, interfaith service delivery, um, starts with a proposition which we as a consortium are willing uh, to see whether it's does it does it have does it rent, does it have any strength on the ground or not is the question of whether poverty creates an enabling environment for the otherizing of people where you blame the others when you feel you are unable to have the minimum access to uh, resources that enable you to fulfill your potential or experience a minimum of uh, well-being. Um, and we will um, support programs that uh, bring together people across different religious divides, but the key point for us here is it's not going to be done through interfaith dialogue, it's going to be done through youth. It is the youth who will be co-constructing and leading on this agenda. Um, Monitoring hate speech is extremely timely, as you're all aware, because so much of the mobilization of hatred against those that differ uh, from the mainstream because of their faith or non-faith happens through the spread of rumors and happens through that um, tipping, uh, that, that cycle of online uh, hate speech feeding into offline and offline feeding into online. Um, we will explore this. Um, um, but also go beyond exploring to develop what we call counter-narratives, narratives that challenge this and, and, and seek to redress it. Um, building coalitions will look at how can we bring unconventional partners together around issues of inclusivity for voice um, and uh, countering um, discrimination. Uh, Cross-fertilization is about bringing together the wealth of expertise. We are, we're not starting something new. Uh, everyone here around the room, many of you have been a champ championing freedom of religion or belief under different names for um, years, perhaps decades. Um, and I think the only way we can do something substantive is for us to learn and cross-fertilize across the different domains, be it human rights, foreign policy, religious leaders, humanitarian or others. Um, and by cross-fertilizing is, we mean that where the sum of all the parts contributes to a greater whole in terms of language, approaches, strategies, complementarity of who's doing what where. Um, so it is from that, 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 that starting point that um, we uh, hope that you will accompany us on this journey over the next four years and we hope as consortium beyond those four, four years, um, this learning journey where we can um, learn with each other on how the sum of all our parts can contribute to bringing freedom of religion and belief into um, those blind spots um, as they exist. Uh, we're going to start with um, our um, uh, 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 camera. I just want to say a very um, a, a, a footnote that while we're extremely grateful for you coming today and for the diversity we have in the room, our original plan was a, a greater level of diversity by having others from other countries, but they have, uh, um, this has been hurt by visa uh, issues. Um, 
and uh, Professor Melissa Leach, together with um, uh, 70 other uh, academics, have written to the Home Office uh, uh, an open letter saying that we cannot have a situation in which we are bringing people together from around the world, uh, funded by UK aid in various contexts, various programs around the UK, uh, and we're unable for people to come because the Home Office is uh, obstructing that uh, process. Uh, and there was a front page uh, article about it um, in The Observer over the weekend. So have a read because obviously um, cross fertilization cannot happen unless we have that variety of voices and perspectives um, that allows for that enriching process. Um, so without much ado, I would uh, like to very briefly introduce the, the panel. Um, you will have more detailed information. I think if I go through the, the profile of each person we have here, um, half an hour for each will not be enough. Uh, so we will just start very briefly that um, um, Mr. Jan Fiegel is a special envoy for the promotion of freedom of religion or belief outside the EU uh, since May 2016. Professor Melissa Leach is the director of the Institute of Development Studies uh, at the University of Sussex. Uh, Professor Michael Wilcock is the lead social scientist in the World Bank's development research group. And uh, Mike Babcock is civil society's team leader as well as head of inclusive societies at DFID. And the whole sort of 30 years of development uh, experience. Thank you, thank you, Marius. Thank you all for joining this uh, call, but especially for the community of those who are keen to come together to work for the better for the better 20th century. Civilization—it's not something kind of important issues. It's civilization because it, there is no deepest expression of human freedom than freedom of thought, freedom of conscience, freedom to believe or not to believe. And once this freedom is respected, the others will follow the same. And if this is not respected, we have totalitarian society or tendency. I can speak a lot about it because I, I live half my life in totalitarian Czechoslovakia. So this is the principle, civilization principle. It's not about the other um, principles, but a very crucial litmus test of all human rights. Litmus test of all human rights. Uh, and of course, human dignity is the foundational principle of all, of all human rights. We have rights because we have dignity. But we have also duties because we have dignity. That's important. We forget. So uh, I, I will try to say a few moments or uh, features I try to defend this. First, uh, European Union special animal, freedom of religion and belief. It speaks by itself that since 2016 we have EU special envoy. And EU started uh, five years after Second World War with Colin Steele and then step by step immigration process. So why only now? And I will come with, to the point where I, where I entered the, the room. Sorry, yes, I'm coming via, via Bratislava from Japan. Uh, it's not easy, but glad to be here and in time. Um, Maris Tadrus spoke about the genocide and about uh, killings, which are so bloody and, and frequent now. Um, uh, we, we really should stop genocidal century. Because if not, then we are <coughs> not, <coughs> not uh, loyal to our commitments. 2015 SDGs, which many of you can even quote, have been adopted solemnly uh, with, with political commitment to make delivery by 2030 uh, quite, quite noble objectives. And at the same time, the same year, there was ongoing publicly known, visible, broadcasted uh, mass killing in I Iraq and in Syria, some important institutions, British Parliament here, uh, I want to uh, comment Lord uh, Alton sitting here, clearly said, expressed, this is genocide. 
European Parliament in February 2016, Council of Europe, Parliamentary Assembly, US Congress, Australia and others. These are not NGOs or and, uh, some organizations declaring genocidal situations. And it means, according to international law, automatic, immediate commitment to prevent genocide, to punish uh, criminals or, or perpetrators and to protect workers. So why I mention it? Because it is paradoxical or a dichotomy in, in modern sense to declare goals which are humanitarian, noble for future, in 15 years, and just to witness, comment, lament over the situation in the Middle East or Near East. We need to do something more than just uh, declare and, and promise. So something has started, at least why I'm here, because the European Union uh, invited somebody to deal with, uh, with these issues right at that time immediately after, because my nomination was requested by the European Parliament resolution. So at least to do something for future. And my role, or what I try day by day, is to make this issue visible. And of course when it's visible we can discuss and describe and also do something about when we see better and more and in advance or ex ante. But this was not an isolated decision. In 2013, 28 countries agreed the first time ever on guidelines how diplomacy, how foreign policy, external policy should deal with freedom of religion and belief. That's important expression of consensus. 2014, the first intergroup uh, was created in the European Parliament. Never before. I hope it will continue now after the elections. 2015, intergovernmental inter, uh, uh, contact group international contact group of diplomats dealing uh, with four uh, globally. And then 2016 I came uh, into, into the arena, but not again isolated, but after my nomination, several countries decided to have uh, their special representative or envoy or ambassador in large. This was uh, Hungary, then uh, Denmark, Germany, after Germany, United Kingdom, Lithuania the last, maybe the Netherlands will follow the summer, maybe, I don't know, I hope, my country also. So now we, we can speak with many, and I should mention others like Norway or Finland, uh, who have special diplomats or policy makers uh, dealing with this agenda. And that's, that's something what, what came out in recent years, I hope it will, it will mean also qualitative change. It's not about quantity of different names or actors, but qualitative approach. Reminding again, never again. So if we care, freedom of religion or belief is a litmus test. And you know what testing means in chemistry or in science. Concerning the uh, European Union, not to speak too much of and, and probably we have a specific instrument for, for, for promotion uh, and concrete projects are supported uh, by the European Instrument for Democracy and Human Rights, EIDHR. Overall investment or support until now reached uh, 22 million euros. It's not much, but it's growing. And there was, years ago there was nothing. So this is, this is one of the uh, good, very uh, concrete signals that uh, this is uh, here and with the new framework, which is seven new framework, financial framework, uh, this instrument should not only last but grow by 10%. So I, I wish that it will deliver uh, uh, good examples for also bilateral and only bilateral assistance. But what is, um, uh, what is uh, new uh, is uh, this connection with uh, development, which I could also read very clearly from the messages as before. I am attached to the DG development in the system of European Commission. Uh, I am working uh, closely with the Commissioner for International Cooperation and uh, Aid Policy. Uh, and it makes sense.
because uh, resources, this is very uh, much uh, attached to, uh, to basic social uh, reforms uh, in, uh, in partner countries. And I must say that uh, we have achieved a lot of concrete, maybe small, but, but important changes. For example, with Lorenzo Natali Price from media, writing, describing stories about development in difficult territories, difficult situations. It has 25 years of history. But only now, 2017, first time ever, there was a prize given to, to the journalists uh, uh, writing on uh, Ford. Never again, it, never before, only now, it started, because Ford is an important part of the world. Uh, we gave prizes uh, to uh, professional and amateur uh, journalists, to be more clear, 5,000 euros each, just to show that we've noticed, we've selected, appreciate uh, this uh, sensitive uh, journalism. Uh, in European Development Days, which is very strong political gathering of personalities, we had a uh, very active and interesting forum organized on religion and gender equality, or religion and in 2017-2018. So it now becomes uh, a tradition or normalcy, but was not there. Because religion was too sensitive, not for us to deal with. I think uh, this was a mistake. And finally, but not, uh, not the least, uh, there is now a new instrument used for, uh, for projects. It's a development uh, cooperation instrument, DCI, very strong, big, and uh, now a new three. Uh, Interface projects uh, agreed and financed over 5 million euros to, uh, altogether in the Middle East and Africa uh, for the period of 2018-2022. Again, first, first time ever development cooperation instrument used for interface projects. Um, there are of course probably other, other bilateral schemes uh, between states but I don't have this overview here. A uh, few ideas uh, to share. <clears throat> what we need uh, is really more strategic approach at country uh, level. We must acknowledge the complexity because each country is different. Uh, it's, um, it's true that many times uh, for in international relations uh, was not uh, being coupled, uh, was not coupled by sound understanding country context. I have the impression that many programs on Ford have been designed so far mainly from human rights perspective or only human rights angle, based on human rights strategies, uh, using human rights language. Um, indeed, four violations are the tips of complex icebergs made of politics and its abuses, lack of governance, fragile rule of law. Uh, soft elements like uh, to the broader culture, to history, uh, very importantly by the extremely delicate relation between state and religions. And in this respect, I wish to praise the, the brand new study uh, issued recently by Danish Institute for Human Rights and Berkeley Center for Religion and Peace titled The International Promotion of Four, uh, Catherine Marshall and Mary uh, Jörg Pedersen. Authors of this uh, interesting study. Secondly, we need to get more and better results on form for through development cooperation. We need, we may require a diversified menu of interventions, use other entry points. I'm convinced that form should be addressed not only, as I said, by human rights specialists, but also through governance, justice, politics, culture, education. The principle favored so, are, so far for the new financial period in the European Union is so-called geographization. geographization. This means less thematic and ad hoc interventions. Uh, and the focus will be uh, country-level programming to bring more consistency and more efficiency. And I hope this can have interesting effects for more structural and strategic support for 
Uh, I would recommend to dig further this idea, which was mentioned uh, just now, of enabling environment, enabling environment. I was for five years commissioner of culture, and culture is on the top of, of values. Economy is necessity, daily bread is necessity. But the sense of living, sense of relations is given or expressed through culture. I'm deeply convinced, convinced as commissioner, former commissioner of Culture, that uh, culture is a great weapon against ideology or against exclusivism. Through so film, theater, literature, you can, we can do a lot. It is important to empower and to challenge faith-based organizations to promote form. We claim, we work, we promote freedom. But freedom will never work without or exist even without responsibility. So what we immediately need to ask for uh, support is religious social responsibility. I use this term because we know uh, corporate social responsibility, what this means, big countries, that it's not only about profit and economy, but society and cohesion. I think that, that uh, religious leaders, religious uh, organizations should be clearly understood as not only duty bear, uh, right holders, but also duty bearers. Uh, and the last thought, uh, never forget to mix diplomacy with development cooperation, which was uh, also somehow mentioned. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the development arms should uh, uh, closely cooperate in this area. <coughs> in the European Union, again, next uh, week we have an interesting seminar on human dignity and religion. We also want to uh, engage with non-human rights specialists. Uh, we organize on Monday next week, uh, together with the Danish Institute of Human Rights and other experts like Noah Ford, uh, expert meeting on Ford literacy. You are cordially invited. If you need more information, I can, I can deliver. So, to close, um, I really want to praise the work of uh, this coalition. Uh, and, and your approach, your setup, and the uh, line taken, which seems to me really quite promising and enriching. And uh, once again, sorry for being maybe a bit late, but uh, we are now connecting special actions or events, especially with uh, Kathleen G20 Interface Forum and this uh, interesting event here. everybody and may I echo Marie's in offering an incredibly warm welcome to all of you and especially those who've travelled from so far to be part of this extraordinarily important launch of a programme that I think, here's the words of the last speaker, is civilizational in its import. So as director of IDS um, I have the privilege to lead an institution that has for a long time worked in development with numerous partners around the world. And I'm very aware that although we've worked on aspects of this agenda, we haven't gripped it to the extent that we should have done. So there we've had debates for decades about the importance of thinking about development as freedom, Amartya Sen and others, the importance of rights and dignity as a key part of development agendas, um, and of course questions of culture and institutions, which I as an anthropologist have always taken on board as key to our development agendas. But why haven't we done as much as we should have done on religion? And how can we now begin to bring and integrate um, agendas around religious freedom and development much more thoroughly to address the challenges of today? Well, I think inequality is a really important entry point, and that's why I'm delighted that the creed has taken on board religious inequality as central to its title. And why is that? Well, some of this came about um, in our own thinking in IDS, where a few years ago we created the five-year strategy we're now working with, which thinks about three really defining challenge areas for where we are now and into the future. Reducing inequalities, building inclusive and secure societies, alongside accelerating transformations to sustainability and dealing with climate change. 
And our focus on inequality there came from a recognition that evidence around the world is showing us that poverty matters, but actually so do the gaps the gaps between the haves and the have-nots, and the profound and intersecting implications that those gaps and forms of discrimination have for addressing the drivers and dynamics of poverty, freedom, vulnerability, marginality. So um, a couple of years ago in 2016, um, I was lucky enough to work with colleagues to lead the World Social Science Report that the International Social Science Council puts out, and in fact there are a number of people who are here today who contributed to that. And what we showed in that report, um, contributions from more than 100 authors around the world, is that inequalities are rising in most parts of the world, that this matters partly for moral reasons. Wide inequalities of any kind are unjust, they have no place in a good society, but also for practical ones. Inequalities compromise achievement of most, if not all, other development objectives. And as we argued, while inequality in the Sustainable Development Goals framework, the UN Global Goals, has its own goal, there it is as goal number 10, it's arguably a central goal which affects all others. But, and this is really important, as we argued in that report, the inequalities that matter are not just those of income and wealth the economic inequalities that have dominated discussions in development. Um, to understand and respond to inequality, we brought together evidence that showed the importance of a multi-dimensional inequality agenda that included religion as part of seven forms of inequality, which include the political inequalities of power and voice, the social, the cultural, the environmental, the spatial and inequalities of, around knowledge. Cultural inequality, we define there as discriminations based on ethnicity and race, religion, disability and other forms of group identity. So religion is a key part, we suggested, of cultural inequalities, but I think it's an extremely important one. Um, but critically, these multiple forms of inequality intersect and interact with others in numerous ways. This is why we now need to think about religious inequality in relation to development. So, some examples. We see these intersections for particular people. Think of a Uyghur woman in western China, Xinjiang province. She is facing intersecting inequalities and discriminations of religion as a member of an Islamic group in a majority Han Chinese Buddhist society, of gender, of income and poverty, of social status and of place in that particular part of a mainstream Chinese society. And Islamic identity in that context is a basis for marginalization from the economic growth that other parts of Chinese society are experiencing. But almost more important, surveillance through digital and online means as well as face-to-face -face ones, and repression um, in a context of state-dominated development, one might argue. We also see these kinds of intersecting inequalities affecting particular groups. So just to pick one example, take Nigeria, where in northern Nigeria we're seeing religious inequalities between Christians and Muslims, associated with deep political and resource struggles. Young people in northern states alienated by economic, by environmental and climate change related inequalities and by political inequalities are often turning to fundamentalist forms of Islam. Um, as a response to alienation and as a source of identity. I think that's something we'll discuss in more depth later this afternoon and I really don't want to simplify. But I think it is possible to make the connections to the way those intersecting inequalities for young people are fueling the violent extremism that we're now seeing in the actions of Boko Haram and others. More generally, as people like Francis Stewart, eminent development economist, have argued, Horizontal inequalities associated with religion, with ethnic identities, are amongst the key drivers of conflict. And we're seeing that in the genocides that we've been talking about this morning, and in countless examples around the world. And the key point here, it's not just religious and cultural difference. We can manage differences, um, that we can accommodate them peacefully. But it's inequalities and discriminations, themselves often driven by deep, political, economic, and social histories. And there's a final example, and one that's very close to home for me at the moment. 
These intersecting equalities also affect our ability as development humanitarian communities to tackle key global challenges. And an example there might come from my own work. I've lived and worked as an anthropologist in Sierra Leone for many decades. And the villages I've lived in there um, have always been, to me, almost kind of notable for their taken for granted everyday religious inclusivity, syncretism you might call it, where the mosque and the church live side by side, where people say we pray to the same God, and where um, beliefs and um, following of formal religions go along with everyday beliefs in a local supreme being, with the bush spirits that manage matters of life and health and death, um, and the forms of power and medicine controlled by women's events in Asian <laughs> societies. When, in 2014, a major outbreak of, of Ebola occurred in that region, um, humanitarian and development agencies sought to arrest it through halting burials, which were one of the key transmission routes. And in doing that, they interrupted key social and cultural protocols through which people in communities were managing their relationships with ancestors, their secret societies, their relationships with bush spirits that would ensure the continuity of social and reproductive life. Unsurprisingly, they resisted. There was a lot of violence towards health workers and humanitarian teams. The response initially from those agencies was to say, we must have safe and dignified burials, and they must follow important religious lines. And so they went for Islam and Christianity and produced guidelines for safe and dignified burials in Islamic terms and Christian terms, both of which failed to hit the mark of actually the forms of religious practice and belief that were driving community responses and ways of life. And they actually proved quite divisive and sowed some religious division in communities that have never had it. Ultimately, it was only when communities took burials into their own hands in their own inclusive ways and outside development and humanitarian agencies established more respectful dialogue with them that the epidemic came under control. So what do I take from this to conclude? I think overcoming religious inequalities and discriminations could not be a more important agenda for now. Um, and it's vital both for justice and for the, the ability to address global challenges, poverty, epidemics, conflict, climate change and more. This means entering a world of analysis and action which is complex. Things do intersect with each other. Um, causality and consequences are often hard to disentangle. In none of these examples is it clear that religion drives conflict, or conflict drives religion. We have multi-way causalities going on. The entry points are varied. There will be some that are extremely grassroots and bottom-up and have to start with people in all their everyday realities. There will be some where national dialogues or global frameworks have a key role to play. Context is always going to matter, the context of particular countries. Quick fixes are going to be elusive, and politics and power cannot be avoided. These issues are fundamentally political. But I think we can't avoid these sorts of complexities if we're to build the respect and inclusivity that we now need. And that's why I look forward with such excitement to seeing the work of Creed unfold over the next few years. Because in the set of partners here, in the agendas, in the sensibilities, I think, through which questions of freedom and religious belief and the way they intersect with development challenges are being addressed, we really do have an opportunity to create a new civilizational paradigm to get to grips with some of the biggest challenges we face in today's world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for including me as part of your discussions today and it's uh, a real honour to be considered as uh, someone who has something hopefully sensible to say about these issues but which I hope over the coming four years will uh, teach me a lot more. My brief is to talk a bit about why it is from a development programming point of view engaging with religion generally and with religious inequalities in particular is so challenging and I want to give three sort of ways in which I think that those challenges manifest themselves, but also just give at least a hint of um, where we see examples of how those challenges can be engaged. And Creed itself, I think, is one manifestation of those kinds of responses. 
very deliberative, very intentional about trying to talk about hard issues and ultimately trying to build out a set of practices. And I'll just um, lend on that. <laughs> but I, I want to start by looking at these three different spaces, as it were, within which the challenge and the task of responding operationally, administratively to these questions manifests itself. The first is the highest level, perhaps, sort of the structural or analytic level. Um, because I think for anyone trying to engage with development, we, and we need to recognize that development itself is a child of modernity. And modernity insists on various different things. The first thing that modernity insists on is separation. Um, we have, if in the economic space, a division of labor, a right? classic concept in economics and in sociology. Uh, your cell phone, for example, is a product of roughly a thousand different companies around the world, all doing a thousand different things to be able to put that wonder of technology in your purse or your pocket. Um, that's a very <clears throat> that's what makes it possible is the fact that the humans are able to super specialize the kinds of things that they are engaged in. Uh, we also have a separation of powers. We talk about that <clears throat> we want to build out countervailing mechanisms to keep different branches of power legalized and in other ways constitutionally separate. Um, we also divide then the sacred and the secular. We have science and religion. We put these in two very different categories. So all these different domains of life start to splinter. That's what modernity does. Uh, the upside of it is a, is a prosperity that we all take for granted, but the <clears throat> very real consequence of all of that, and what makes it possible paradoxically, is the fact that it just insists on having hyper-specialization and very particular categories around each of those specializations. Uh, and in the space of religion, then, they also become very discrete realms of activity. So we talk about whether someone is religious or not, as if that's a particular box they reside in or not. And uh, we, when we're talking about church and state, or whether we're talking about science and religion, each modernity insists that these be self-contained, uh, discrete categories of thinking and doing uh, to be wheeled in or out or to be elevated up or down depending on the prevailing political moment. They become, as the historian and philosopher Peter Harrison calls it, separate territories. They become different realms of their own logics of inquiry, which is not how they work historically, more or less. Um, and we see that also within the space of religion itself, this incredible splintering into a whole different array of things following perhaps those, <laughs> as a result of the Reformation. As I happen to spend part of last summer in southern Nigeria, and I've just never been to a hyper pluralist religious space in my entire life. Just, uh, <laughs> everywhere you go, there's like some form of church that's sort of inventing itself around its own name, its own particular micro theology around all these questions. And that's just a sort of modernity on steroids, where everything just gets put out into this hyperspace of, of, of difference and somehow needs to figure out how to put itself all back together again. The second thing that modernity insists on, I think, is that the truth or falsity of knowledge claims uh, be done on largely empirical terms, with faith then becoming a set of intellectual propositions to which one gives assent rather than a set of behavioral practices. And then we end up with rather ugly disputes, even or especially within particular faith traditions, centered on fidelity to particular propositional claims about belief. The veracity of religious texts become assessed on empirical rather than experiential or historical grounds. And because development itself is then experienced so fitfully and partially, the very act of trying to build roads and schools and hospitals and and the like. It can become very de deeply destabilizing to faith traditions where it is ontologically normal to see everything as deeply and inherently integrated. And the kind of example that, that Melissa just gave you from, uh, from Sierra Leone, of where uh, there is a syncretic coherence to bringing all these different things together, which is in, in that particular world regarded as entirely normal. Now, we, from the modern West or the modern modernity perspective, always want to see these things as very different and separate. And uh, left to its own devices, people are actually pretty amazing how they can figure out how to reconcile what to others often seems very irreconcilable. Uh, the very act of providing education, of teaching people about how the world is structured, can itself be an agent of uh, destabilizing a lot of the otherwise uh, internally coherent ways in which people make sense of the world. 
So paradoxically then, I think, uh, much of what we do in religion, I mean, in the name of development programming, uh, which not much of which is well-intentioned, much of which actually succeeds, is in some sense often uh, doing work that is undermining a prevailing, coherent way of making sense of the world, where the separation that we otherwise insist on and regard as normal and normative in the West is just not that way. Um, I think a counterpoint to that, though, is for all this separation, modernity also drives us together. The very thing that makes the cell phone possible is the fact that all these thousand companies are, in fact, not just separate, but they're integrated. And so we live in a world in which we have simultaneously deep division and relentless pressures pushing us all together. And so that's what makes it civilizational. The fact that these twin forces of, uh, of coming together and falling apart, as it were, uh, need to be accommodated, need to be managed, perhaps, and in ways that um, are able to accommodate such very different imperatives. I think uh, Charles Taylor, the philosopher, is probably our best articulator of, sort of, of the nature of that dynamic that we find ourselves wrestling with. The second big factor that makes it really challenging to uh, wrap all of this development programming work around the space of religion is just the administrative logic of how we do development. Um, and the instruments that we have for managing money and people and for turning ideas into action most of the time have to function within very short time frames. They need to address issues that are photogenic, very measurable, and very tangible. And as development space itself comes under increasing pressures to demonstrate its utility in terms of helping people to get out of poverty, those pressures to focus ever relentlessly more on those tangible photogenic uh, uh, interventions becomes only the more intense. Moreover, when acting developmentally in the name of religion, we expect there to be some material payoff. Uh, if we're going to do this religion thing, then it will be justified because it's now going to lead to uh, improved health or higher incomes or better education, which can be a good reason for doing those things. But I don't think we should, the, the argument for being engaged in this space is not that it's somehow just a add religion and stir and somehow beautiful things will happen in the world. Uh, the essence of engaging with these questions for many people is that they are a deep end in themselves. They're not a means to something else. They are intrinsic to who we are. They are intrinsic to how we make sense of the world, to our identities, and to how we accommodate the difference in the world. And so we need to protect the space for engaging in religion on, on, on intrinsic grounds, not just instrumental grounds, even though on, on, under certain conditions it may well be the case that doing a better job of just accommodating the religious realities of the context within which we work may indeed lead to better outcomes, again, as, as Melissa indicated with her example from Sarah Leon. So in this particular space, we just need, I think, a, a, a different kind of work to be done to help us think about what kind of administrative logics do we need to actually do this work in much more uh, effective ways, but effective not understood in, in necessarily in these instrumental ways, but in ways that does in fact take this thing called context seriously, but realize that the context here isn't just geography, isn't just uh, history and politics, but something much more ephemeral and simultaneously much more important to many people than other of those things. The third space in which it is problematic for the development programming apparatus to get its head around religion, I think, is that all of this activity has to be legible, to use James Scott's wonderful phrase. It has to be legible to our administrative systems. It has to be legible also to researchers, to accountants, to auditors, to funders, and the general public. So what we do in this space has to elicit data, has to elicit evidence of some kind or another that uh, is able to fit into the instrumental ways in which we do our work. This means that we tend to engage, I think, with religion as a demographic category. We, don't, we deal with religion as a, uh, in, in, in the space of what I call the demographics of difference, because we insist that people tick a certain box, that they reside in, in a particular category, uh, either called religion generally or a particular religious group within that. Uh, and that very instrumentality, that very way of engaging with, uh, with religion, or with, uh, with humans in general, as a, a long and vexed history of being an instrument of rule. It's how the British managed to do a lot of their work in the colonialism in India, was to turn a much more fluid sense of caste into very discrete categories that none have to tick a box and self-identify into one particular group. Uh, Nicholas, uh, Nicholas uh, Turks is the, is the famous work, not 
on that particular issue. Other people looking at Sukarno in Indonesia, all of these mid 20th century efforts were centered very powerfully on turning fluidity into structure that could then be used both for measurement purposes but as, as an instrument of control and instrument of law. And if we're going to be doing serious research in this space, I think we need to recognize that the very act of, of recognizing the demographics of, of difference needs to be complemented by the dynamics of difference, that under very particular kinds of conditions, under this hyper-intersectional world in which we live, certain aspects of people's identities will come to matter more than others. And understanding the conditions under which those things become politically salient, become a source of division, is really central to, uh, to what we need to be engaging with. It's also, to use Charles Tilley's memorable phrase, one of the mechanisms by which these durable inequalities persist over time. And so, as much as we need to be doing the work on the demographics of difference, I think the dynamics of difference are really are important as well. So there's these three domains in which I think it's all together add up to a pretty <laughs> a steep hill that one climbs when one tries to take religion seriously and tries to do either normal social science or normal development program. If we struggle in this space in this sense, I don't think it's mainly because we're discriminating against religion as, as such, just because the logic of the the way in which we talk, the way in which we think, and the way in which we act is, is grounded in these very particular words, these very particular instruments that themselves need to be pushed back on a little bit. I'll conclude just by giving one short, simple example uh, of how people on teams can somehow get around these. As it happened uh, earlier this year, I was in New Zealand, the week after the tragic events there that left 50 people dead. And uh, I made a little wager with myself before I went that somehow this experience was going to be very profound. <laughs> It was going to be really different. That these big questions around how modernity, how uh, administration, and how measurement and all of this would be handled in New Zealand would be different. And it really was. So you would have saw, I'm, I'm sure, that the various different ways in which the leadership of, of, of New Zealand accommodated this. Um, you, I think what moved me more, though, was not just the, the effective leadership, but was the way in which the response was across the whole society. Without, any fanfare without how without sort of proclamations of how awesome they are as people for being able to deal with this, that what was so special was just seeing how normal it was that New Zealand was able to deal with this enormous tragedy. And why is that possible? I think because it's a product of decades, if not a century or more, of practicing routinely how to accommodate difference, whether it's with indigenous folks or with I don't know, an array of different immigrant groups as well. These, these kinds of deeply challenging tasks require a long series of baked in <laughs> cultural and political practices. They need to be practiced. They need, like any other skill in life, they need to be acquired and learned the hard way. And I hope, in its own small way, that something that we're doing through this feed network or the feed program can be its own little contribution to figuring out how to construct these practices that enable all of this difference, all of, all of the volatility, but all of the beauty that goes with being able to harness all of that difference into something that indeed does make the world a better place. Thank you very much. I'm Mike Batcock. I work at the UK Department for International Development. As Maria said, I worked in international development for more than 30 years. And for all of that time, I have been involved in working with faith groups and on religious issues. For many years, I worked in a very traditional development organization, and nearly all of our partners across the world were faith groups. Since joining DFID, I worked in a number of departments, and I've worked on probably all of the key pieces of work on religion and development at DFID. Back in 2003, I was involved in a stock tape and a mapping of our work on faith groups. This led to the creation and our support of the Religions and Development Research Program led by Carol Ricodi at the University of Birmingham. This produced a phenomenal body of work on, on religions and development. Um, Later, in 2010, I was involved in the work, I led the work on the Faith Partnership Principles, which involved working with faith groups to try and address the distrust between faith groups and government donors such as DFID, and a 
and identify effective ways of working together. This came up with a series of recommendations that DFIT needed to build up our understanding of the role of faith in development. We needed to document the impact of faith groups more effectively, and we needed to create safe spaces for discussion. We've been implementing that ever since. I am now in DFIT leading on our work on freedom of religion or belief. The UK government is committed defending freedom of religion or belief. We are committed to promoting respect between communities, uh, between faiths and with those with no religion. Freedom of religion or belief is a universal human right. Religious intolerance and persecution are at the heart of many development challenges. As Jan Field said, when freedom of religion or belief is under attack, often other human rights are threatened. It's a litmus test on human rights. Societies that protect freedom of religion or belief are more stable, more prosperous and resilient. We are concerned by the scale of violations of freedom of religion or belief around the world. Pew Centre has identified that 75% of the world live in countries where freedom of religion or belief is under threat. This is rising in many countries across the world. The UK government works to address these issues at multilateral level, bilateral level and local level. Multilateral level, we work at the UN with like-minded organisations, like-minded countries to support freedom of religion or belief. At the country level, we raise concerns, we highlight practices that discriminate against specific religious communities. And at the local level, we provide support to programs. The Prime Minister is committed to this. She has said she will stand up for people of all religions to practice their beliefs in peace and security. The Prime Minister appointed Lord Ahmed as a special envoy on freedom of religion and belief, which shows the real commitment to this issue. The Foreign Secretary has commissioned the Bishop of Truro to review the persecution of Christians. DFID worked very closely with the Foreign and Commonwealth Office on these issues. Uh, for all the work that DFID does with uh, governments, we look at the issue of freedom of religion and part of our partnership principles. Development and humanitarian aid is given on the basis of need, irrespective of race and religious uh, or ethnicity. The situation of minority communities, including religious minorities, is taken into account and we actively consult with all groups. This brings us on to this program, CREED. We're supporting this program through UK Aid Connect. This is a funding scheme which is trying to bring together a whole range of different development actors, research institutions, the private sector, human rights organisations, civil society organisations, bringing together all the different actors to address key development challenges. We identified freedom of religion and belief as one of these key development challenges. This is DFID's most uh, significant program that we have supported on freedom of religion and belief. And I am really excited to hear about how this work is going to be taken forward.